Okay, the second major proxy war we're gonna talk about here today is gonna to take place in Cuba. And just like with the first one, I wanna do a quick history. Um, and I might go a little deeper here than I did in, in Korea because um, Cuba, well, no, maybe not. Look, Cuba has historically been the main hub of the Spanish empire going back to the age of exploration. Um, and then after the Spanish-American War of 1898, the U.S. took Cuba as part of the deal. Um, Cuba's a big, beautiful, gorgeous island right off Florida. And um, the U.S. was very, very influential in Cuba during the years after the um, Spanish-American War. In fact, I oftentimes say that Cuba, and here's a picture of Cuba pre-Castro, pre-revolution of 1959 or 1960, um, was Vegas and Hawaii combined, right? If you've ever been to the Caribbean, Caribbean Sea um, it is one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's, it's got like warm water beaches like bath water. There aren't big waves. You can clear see the water. It's just insane and beautiful and, and hot and gorgeous. And oh my gosh, I want to go so badly to Cuba. Um, and, then the, and then they had casinos and gambling and the U.S. was influential. So it was Vegas and it was, it was Hawaii combined. It was a, it was a tropical paradise. It was a, a vacation destination. Here's a, here's a casino in 1959 or something. You can see these are probably mostly Americans, right? American influenced people down there running this gorgeous casino for 1959. I mean, that, that's, that's Vegas. That's, you know, the pink flamingo or, or, or the Tropicana or whatever, you know, Casinos were big in Vegas at that point. I think the Flamingo was one of the first, okay? Um, everyone wanted to go to Cuba and, and vacation. And in 1959, a guy named Fidel Castro overthrows a guy named Virgilio Bautista and takes control of Cuba and turns it communist. Okay, here is a picture of young Fidel Castro during this period, he's wearing his, his army outfits. Why is it that, that um, dictators often wear military fatigues? I don't know. Um, but um, Hitler did it right. Mussolini, we've talked about this. Hey, Fidel, jump on board. Okay, maybe he learned it from Stalin. Because Stalin was his buddy. Okay, but look, he takes over in 1959, and he pushes socialism. Not necessarily extreme communism, Soviet style. Um, but he wants socialism. He doesn't want America to influence Cuba anymore. He says, let us be our own place. Let us have a socialist system. I, I think that the, the poor people of Cuba deserve some of this money because again, Cuba is very rich. He said, but it's all American money. And now goes, and we're not getting the benefits. Um, so he goes and then he, and he turns Cuba communist. Um, in 19, at the end of the 1960s, um, President Eisenhower, who, who um, wildly popular president, he, he was great, I guess, during his time. I, I have respect for the man. Um, he, had, he, he was really strong against communism. Ever since the, the Korean War, he, he came out strong against communism. He, he threatened, I'm going to drop nuclear bombs if you guys try and take over land in, in Europe, right? He, he was tough. On, on the Soviet Union. Um, he's an old general, World War II general, Ike, right? Um, so, so he had a plan to take back Cuba from Castro. And, and what happened was there were a bunch of Cubans. After the revolution, a bunch of Cubans um, were jailed, a bunch were exiled, and a bunch just left. And when, when they left, they went to Florida, okay? They went to Miami. It's a city that's hugely influenced by Cuban refugees during this period. And um, they, they, they had formed um, a militia who was going to go in there, Cuban refugees, not U.S. Army, and they were going to take back Cuba. And, and Eisenhower had promised him um, ships and air support and anything he needs and weapons. We've got you. Go get Cuba back. We don't like Cuba being socialist or communist, okay? Um, and um, in 1961, now we have a new president. It's young President JFK. And JFK freezes. Now, you know, JFK is a beloved president, and I got nothing but tons of respect for the man. But at this point, um, if you're going to do something like this, if you're going to allow this secretly American-trained and American-armed group of Cuban exiles to move in and take Cuba, you've got to 
be all 100%. You can't go 50%. And, and he didn't give the air support. He promised we're going we're gonna to bring the jets in, we'll bomb the heck out of them, and then you guys roll up on our ship with our ships and our guns, and you guys take it back. And there was a pretty fair amount of Cubans were going to do this. Well, last minute, the ships are rolling up, right? No air support. And then they get there on shore, and the Cubans kill them, jail them, capture them. This is called the Bay of Pigs. Okay, it's a failed invasion. Bay of Pigs. Um, and at this point, right, we're going to see that um, Castro now is going to have to buddy up more with the Soviet Union. He says, oh, man, America would, would do us like that, right? We can't trust America anymore. America just tried to invade us. And, and if Kennedy had provided the air support that he, he had, you know, he, he, they would have done it. America would have taken back Cuba. Um, from Castro. So he buddies up with the Soviet Union, and now that means that he's going to be a stronger version of communist. He's not going to be, oh, socialist slash communist, you know, I want to have jobs and food and land redistribution for everyone, but, mm, you know, I'm not that extreme. You are now, and, and the Soviets are giving him money, okay? And, and as part of the deal, the Soviets go, well, what we really want from you, Fidel? We want to build nuclear weapons and put them in Cuba so that if we wanted to, and this is a picture of it, we could drop nukes on the U.S. and they would get there really quickly. Because the old story goes, and these are stories that I grew up with. I'm a tail end Cold War baby and I used to ask a lot of questions when I was young. And the old story is that if, if a missile was launched from the Soviet Union, it would take, I don't know, an hour to get to, the Amer to America. 45 minutes, half hour in this range. In that time, America could prepare, America could, Americans could hide, blah, blah, blah. In theory, that's of course, if they didn't come across with a jet and drop the bomb, okay. Um, but if they, were, if they were in Cuba, America, they could launch attacks on DC that would show up in a matter of minutes, you know, 10, 15, 10 minutes, you know, versus like missiles from the other side of the world. And then they would be much more accurate from Cuba. I think that sometimes people forget how inaccurate missiles were during that period, um, launched from the other side of the world. So um, this was the deal. And, and Castro said, yeah, and he probably wouldn't have said yes if it weren't for the Bay of Pigs. Um, but, but he does, he, he agrees. And he, the Soviet Union starts building up a nuclear arsenal in Cuba. The US has satellites and we're taking pictures of it all. And then we go to the UN and we say, oh my gosh, you guys, look what they're building. They're building nuclear weapons in Cuba and they're pointing it at us, okay? I can't let this fly. And the UN sends emergency messages to the, to, um, to, the, to the Soviet Union. I believe Stalin had died. The new leader was a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. And Khrushchev was like, what about it, dude? Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and then the US says, well, you can't do anymore. No more building. I'm not letting your ships get to Cuba. And Khrushchev's like, how are you going to do that? <laughs> and Kennedy says, I'll show you. So Kennedy lines up his ships. And we'll go back to this map. This is an imperfect map here. He lines up his ships right about here, okay, in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. And he goes, if your ships get within our sight, I'm going to blow you out of the water. And if you have a problem with it, it's on. Full-on war, U.S., USSR. Boom right? Um, and this is horrifying because everyone knows that this is a potential nuclear war. They have nuclear bombs, we have nuclear bombs. One of the things that wasn't discussed much was that we had nuclear bombs in Turkey and in um, Europe, which would have gotten to Russia much quicker than their nuclear bombs would have and would have been much more accurate than their nuclear bombs would have been. But who cares? They would have probably hit somewhere and that would mean nuclear explosions in America and they had enough nuclear bombs that they could have completely devastated our country. We could have completely devastated their country. And, and, and for, for, for weeks, every day in the news, they would come out. They'd be like, oh my gosh, the Russians haven't turned around yet. And, and, and people were dying fall off shelters. It was an emergency and, and people were freaking out. Nuclear war, nuclear war, nuclear war. Um, and, and each day they got closer and closer and closer and closer. And all of a sudden, and you know, okay, 
<laughs> that the, because of the curvature of the earth, you could only see seven miles on flat land ahead of you. So they're saying like, oh my gosh, they're 50 miles away there. They're close. Okay, we're about to have war with the Soviet Union and it'll probably go nuclear. Oh, M. Goodness. Um, and, uh, and at the very last minute, Khrushchev and Kennedy have an emergency phone call. They agree to stop it. Kennedy says, I'll take all of my weapons, my nukes out of Turkey. If you take all of your nukes out of Cuba, they agree. There's a handshake. <sighs> Nuclear war averted. This is called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And after that, um, well, you know, is Cuba's going to be a communist country in the Americas, and they're going to foment revo communist revolution in American countries, especially one man by the name of Che Guevara, who's famously going to go around in many Latin American countries and try and influence their leaders to go communist or socialist. Um, this is one of the countries where this famously happens is Chile. Um, in Chile, the leader... Salvatore Dende, um, he decides that he's going to give do land redistribution. And this is a big one, land redistribution. Remember that, because that's what in Latin America they were planning on doing, taking the land from the rich landowners and giving it to poor people. Um, and the rich landowners were buddies with America. Sometimes Americans had a bunch of land, right, in Latin America. They probably still do. I don't know. The whole bananas, almost like, what, half of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras? Don't quote me on that but they used to own a lot. Um, and uh, Salvatore Dende said, I'm gonna, I, he ran for president, it was a democratic election, and he says, every child gets a cup of milk. Land redistribution, taken from the rich, given to the poor, and I'm gonna make sure that every single child in this country gets a cup of milk every day, free from the government. That's a great idea, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should not be giving my opinion in this class. Um, but a cup of milk for every kid. You know that during this pandemic, that the, every step, lunch has been free for every child in, in our city. And then next, and I think in the whole country, and that all next year, lunch is free for everyone. Free lunch for everyone. Okay, my daughters come home from school and they have bags of breakfast and dinner. Every day, they're given all sorts of free food in America. Oh my gosh, communism. No, that's what's called feeding your children of your country. They, Okay, land redistribution issues, but this was a poor country. You just wanted to give kids milk, man. So, and on September 11th, 1973, the U.S. bombs his palace, sends in troops, and kills him. He was, of course, influenced by Cuba, and Cuba's going to do this for a while. And then the Soviet Union collapses in 1990, and Cuba is left alone. And since then, Cuba has been in a horrible place because their big buddy who used to give them money over there is no longer... Okay, they, at one point they were giving money to Venezuela and now Venezuela is in a horrible place. All these Latin American countries that have tried to turn communist have really had terrible outcomes, okay? And then, you know, um, in 2010, Obama opened the door to Cuban relations. He goes, man, you know, we're friends with Vietnam, we're friends with you know, all these countries we used to fight. Let's just open up the door to Cuba. Um, we'll be friends with them again. Um, and he tried to open up the door. It was slowly opening. When Trump came back in, slam, the door right back shut. Cuba is cut off. There's been sanctions on Cuba for the last 60 years. Because of this moment, we don't trade with them. We don't buy with them. If you ever go to Cuba, you know what you see? You see a bunch of these cars because we haven't given them any new cars. But American cars back then were built so well that they can be rebuilt, but they're all old and rusted. But um, anyways, what's the story? The people of Cuba suffered. And now Fidel dies, his brother takes over. Is his brother given up power? Could that open the door for us to have diplomatic relations with Cuba again? Biden's in power, it's, it's not Trump, I don't know. But what I do know, and I repeat myself because I'm a broken record, is that when proxy wars take place in your country, your people suffer. 